You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. And you are listening to episode 49 of the Cynic Radio Podcast. And I'm your host, Cynic. And with me, as always, my co-host, and at his request, I'll state, the greatest man alive, your friend and mine, Igri. Ryan George is back with us again this week, and may I say also for the record, he was on time. On this week's show, we review the third and final Star Wars prequel entitled Revenge of the Sith. Because we are the Cynic Radio Podcast, and we guarantee at least three mispronunciations a minute, or double your money back. Like, listen, and subscribe. Most importantly, enjoy the show. And it's time for the CRP's brief and vague recap. Down 0-2, Lucas has dug himself quite a hole. With his last chance at redemption, the third and final installment of the Star Wars prequels, this is our review of Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. IG, based on the first two movies, were your hopes slightly tamed headed into this one? Actually, no. Um, this is the part where we get to get the actual full downfall of Anakin and the turn into Darth Vader. So I was fingers crossed and hoping in my heart of hearts that this would be the time that everything came together, everything was going to be better, because we get to actually see the transformation into Darth Vader, see what happened, what put him in the suit. I was, my hopes were really high on this one. I I was just kind of forgiving the last two. Ryan, take us all the way back to 2005, opening night. Did you see it when it came out, and where did you see it? I do remember. I did see it. I saw it opening night uh, with one of my best friends. Um, I think we were roommates at the time uh, at the was the Lowe's up on, I think, 84th Street or something in Manhattan. Uh, so I was actually really excited because, you know, as I explained uh, before, when The Phantom Menace came out, I wasn't a huge Star Wars fan. Uh, and it was, and it wasn't until around the time that um, Attack of the Clones came out that I really became a big fan. Cause I kind of, a lot of my own really getting into it started with some of the video games, and then I got really into the, a couple of video games, and then I got into, then I really got into movies, and I watched the movies over and over, and started reading the books. So I, you know, kind of my own fandom at that point was was where I was really becoming a, a bigger fan of, of the franchise. So I was really excited, in spite of you know my you know kind of tep- review of uh, episode one and my very negative view of episode two I was actually very very excited going into it and and I think the trailers um, I don't know if you guys remember it, the trailers were really good like the tra- you know regardless of how what you thought of the first two like the trailers for episode three were, were excellent and that really got me kind of hyped up and excited to to go see it well, that's the thing too. I mean, by this time the internet is in full swing. The other, the other times it was still more like in an infantile stage, and trailers and reviews weren't as big. But the internet has really started turning. This one was important to me because this is where my life really started to to kind of take flight. I'd uh, been a couple years into my job at that point. I had always loved Star Wars as a kid and growing up, and I watched the movies over and over again. But then in 2003, they released a game called Star Wars Galaxies, which was an online MMO. And that, my obsession with that, had taken full flight. So my life at that point was all about Star Wars. And uh, I even took off from work, which, you know, I got teased relentlessly about. And another important factor in my life is it was the first Star Wars movie that came out that my good friend, now, you know, head of life mate, Ig, was in my life. And we talked that movie relentlessly leading up to it. We could not wait to see it. We kind of went around the same time as each other so we could see it at the same time, so we could get off, uh, get out at the same time and talk to uh, talk to each other about that movie. So it was important in my life. A lot of big aspects of my life came together around that movie, and it's probably the Star Wars movie that I've actually watched the most, even though it has some of the problems that we're going to discuss coming up. How about you, IG? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, we, you and I saw it on the same night around the same time, uh, right after release, so we're an hour difference, so that's the only difference in when we saw it. I saw it at the, the same theater I'd seen all the rest of the movies at. It was the last Star Wars movie to pre- premiere at that theater. The theater's now closed. Uh, I really was excited because, I mean, Star Wars been a big part of my life my whole life, but like you, I was a couple of years into a decent job, and I was doing all right and married and kids and it was just something that was mine because my wife enjoys star wars but she's not she if she watches it great if she doesn't she's still fine when new star wars comes out i'm like a a, like like a little kid again and i gotta sit down and i gotta look at it right now she just was like oh good for you honey and you know she made me a jacket with an imperial symbol on the back of it and 
it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun to just have all the hype coming up to it because the I mean, and I would just sit like almost daily and watch the trailer on the internet. It was so much fun. When I do these reviews, I do them based off the movie. And now I realize people have read the books and I realize that people are, are deep, deep, deep into fandom and know every single fact, everything. Ryan, what's your feel on the whole debate over, you know, was the extended universe ever supposed to be canon? I mean, I know at one point it was, and then they started their own expanded universe, and some of that is now canon, but some of it's not. Where do you fall on that debate? Uh, You know, I I think, I don't call it a silly debate, but I think, you know, I kind of feel the way I always felt, was, which is that obviously the movies, you know, the most important, and anything that happens there kind of supersedes anything else. I I love the extended universe. Some of it's great, some of it's terrible, but I, I like that, you know, it's such a huge universe that why not write stories about it? And I think that there have been so many great things to come out of it that I think it's a really important part of, of it. Um, you know, I kind of like what Disney's done now where it seems like mo- most, you know, the, the books are, can't, everything's kind of kind of considered at the same level. So what's nice about that is if you're, if you're someone who just wants to go see the movies, you know, like for me, for most comics, I, I don't read a lot of comics anymore. So I like that I could just go see the movies. I don't have to know, you know, read the comics, but you get more context through that. And so I, you know, I feel the same way with, with this. Um, you know, I like that it, everything is canon. So if you want to get more context, more information, you can go back and read a book. You can read about any number of different stories it takes because it's such a large universe. There's a big kind of sandbox to play in. But at the same time, if you don't, you can just enjoy the movies and you don't need that, that context. So I'm not, I, I did like that Disney kind of brought it all into one thing rather than having different levels of, of uh, canon. But, I, you know, I, yeah, I don't think it's a, it's, it should be a huge debate because at the end of the day, you've got the movies and, and, then, you have every, and then everything else comes after that. Well, you know, the thing, the thing with all of that, one of the things they did, like they wiped all the, all the EU stuff out, right? All those books, all that stuff, they're like, that's not canon anymore. But there was a fan favorite in there, right? Now, and it started with some of the earliest stuff that happened during the prequel era, which was the uh, Heir to the Empire trilogy from Timothy Zahn. Uh, and he had a character in his stuff called uh, Admiral Thrawn. So, in theory, that was all thrown out, gone. But if you've watched Rebels, Thrawn is back. So, they do recognize where things are great. Because that trilogy with Admiral Thrawn was absolutely amazing. And, I mean, they explain things like, if you know that the what the Empire is, the Empire is kind of a racist organization. Very few aliens. And all of a sudden, here's this blue guy. So, obviously, not just a human. That's an alien. He's blue. And But he was so captivating in those books. And the fact that they brought him back and put him in. I mean, and he was in one little spot in Star Wars Galaxies, if we remember, Cynic. He was out there. He didn't do anything. He was just there. But... You know, they put him in the game. We were all like little kids with that. Ah, they got Thrawn here. And then when they put him in Rebels, and now you get to get a little more of who he is on a screen instead of just imagining it in your mind while you're reading the book. They, the Disney and Star Wars have come together and at least put some of it back. Now, some of the things ended up awful, just like Ryan said. Some of it was absolutely wonderful. Some of it was just okay. If they continue to take some of the stuff that was wonderful and put it back in, I'm good. So they've already started down that path. Let's hope they could continue in some of these other things. Even if it's on the spinoff movies, they throw some stuff back in. That's great. Well, and I like the fact that they're spider webbing everything together. I mean, there was even a head nod to Star Wars Rebels during Rogue One, which I thought was pretty cool and pretty amazing. Like, you, you would never think that they would do that. You would never think that they'd bring up a cartoon or include a ship that was in a, a, a you know, a, a TV show during the movie. It, it was very cool. I like the way they do it. I like the way that they're now writing uh, novels around the movies before they come out and when they come out to, to further enhance your experience. And I read the book for this particular, uh, for this particular movie, and it gives you so much more depth to what's going on. It, you know, you get a better look at the characters we're going to talk about, like Grievous and Dooku, and, you know, what the characters were thinking in the moment. So I don't want to be that guy that, oh, yeah, the book was better. It, the book is always better, obviously. But it, sometimes it's nice to understand what's actually happening in the moment because they don't always do a, a really good job translating what goes on screen to what's going on inside the character. Well, the important thing with the with the book for, for this, if it did nothing else, it was that it gave 
it, it allowed you to kind of empath sympathize with um, Anakin a little bit. Like you understood what was going on in his head. And again, I mean, we you know I don't don't want to harp on the, his performance, but we're, we'll probably will a little bit. But the performance is so wooden that getting reading into like what he's thinking and what's going on in that conflict and that kind of tr suppressing that the dragon uh you know i think that was a huge part of the book where you know i don't know that it was better than the movie but it gave some context and, and more than anything it really kind of allowed you to feel what was going on in inside the mind of, of anakin so ig the chancellor has gotten himself kidnapped to open the movie by the separatists and they've decided rather than take the money and run they decide to park their fleet and their captive right on top of coruscant which i thought was a, just an amazingly strategic idea other than the lo odd location, what did you think of the Jedi Starfighters and the space battle to get to General Grievous's command ship? Well, it's our second look at Jedi Starfighters because we saw them with Obi-Wan in the last movie. Um, but we didn't see them really doing all that much because he was more evading than trying to attack. This We get to actually see Jedi in space flying ships using the Force to help them aim and attack and do things. And it worked. I liked it. Um, it showed the natural flying ability. So this helped for me strengthen Luke in A New Hope when he's flying down the Death Star Trench because the innate ability to sense where you need to go and what you need to do just seemed apropos then. So like, if, if, Je if Jedi can do that because they can feel where things are happening, well, of course Luke can do it, even though he's untrained because some of it is just feeling. I, I liked how they worked, and I liked how they were able to, I mean, at super high speed, in space, everything else going on, people shooting at them, and they're able to use their ships to scrape little droids off of each other and fly complex patterns and just blow things up left and right. So cool. It really was. I mean, and they didn't really, I mean, you saw the other conflicts going on, but they didn't focus on any of that. It was really about Anakin and Obi-Wan kind of teaming up together, wreaking havoc. And it was it was a lot of fun. And it was one of the few times, too, in the trilogy that they actually showed that they were a good unit together. You know, even though they were disagreeing about each other's tactics and the way things were going, you know, you could tell that they had each other's back. And in that, you know, outside of combat, they may be uh, a divided force, but inside of combat, uh, combat, they were a formidable unit. Like, they were working together and talking to each other. One of the things that struck me pretty well, or uh, made me happy about this scene anyway, was that the CGI actually worked. It looked good. It looked realistic. I was captivated by it. I noticed in this movie that it was really, really close to where it is today. However, when you're standing in a large scale someplace, it, it that's where it seemed to falter a little bit. But in the context of the space battle, I thought it was pretty amazing. Well, and like I said, in, in response to that, I said, even in when we were talking about episode one, the CGI works when it's ships, when it's fighting things in space, when it's stuff like that. It's when they want to do too many people, when they want to do creatures and things and add so much more to a place that doesn't need that much more. That's where they falter. So it's when they try and overcrowd a city street or something with all that CGI. That's messy. But ju just like when they did it in the, uh, in the special editions, adding ships and things, it just adds more to it and it looks real and it's great. Yeah, I thought I, I, I agree with you guys. I don't have a lot more to add. I think it was a really well done scene. Um, it does still hold up. Uh, I like the battle. I like seeing um, Anakin as the, like the best pilot in the galaxy. I like I like the way it worked. You know, I like that part, um, the way it opens you know, right into the action. So I think, uh, you know, that that was great. Uh, you know, and I think this starts to be where, you know, I, I started to get a little bit more hope for, for this movie, you know, coming out strong because I think yeah, the CGI was good. Um, it was kind of in, in, an engaging battle. You're really into it. Uh, it holds up. You know, they're doing some cool. They did some really cool stuff. Uh, so I really I really enjoyed that scene. So we get on to Grievous' ship, and once again, the, the few bits of humor that we did get in this movie were brought to you by R2 and C-3PO. R2 right away is doing R2 shit and gets captured by some uh, battle droids. In the process, he sprays oil all over him, and then he sets him on fire. I mean, at last movie he was flying, this movie he has offensive capabilities. Ryan, I mean, did this make the 4, 5, and 6 R2 look really, really antiquated? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it did, and it just doesn't feel right. Like, it's cool. You know, kind of like uh, Bouncy Yoda, although I can give... I, I, I like this a lot less than Bouncy Yo Yoda. I think... Um, yeah, it just it doesn't feel right. It's not R2. R2, you know, we, we've seen him 
we've seen him use what he had, you know, in the, in the original trilogy to kind of make make do. And so it would have been cool to see him be more clever rather than to just pull out all these different gadgets that he why wouldn't he have it in the original trilogy? So I feel, yeah, I felt it's just jarring. And it's a little strange to watch. Uh, and I feel like there, there could have been clever and, you know, funny ways to have R2 get out of these problems rather than have him, you know, attacking and flying around and doing all that. It just, it just like does, doesn't work in context. IG in a ship that holds tens of thousands of droids. They have just one minor skirmish and an elevator ride to rescue Palpatine. Even though Count Dooku is waiting for them, for the final showdown, would you have liked to see them make it slightly harder to reach the Chancellor? I mean, for you gamers out there, it was like one trash pull and straight into the bo- uh, boss mob. Well, you know, gamers would love the one trash pull and straight into the boss mob, but I would have liked to have seen a little more Jedi use, right? I'd like to see them see what two, one Jedi Master and one nearly Jedi Master are able to do to push themselves through a rather formidable force because they're droids so they know how they're going to operate right because that was the problem that's how come clones work so well against droids is because droids kind of follow a path and clones can change their tactics based on the situation but to watch a couple of jedi just swarth their way through a large force might have been more fun than the small skirmish they ended up in because it wasn't even a major skirmish they i don't even think they sent droidicas did they just a couple of super droids and some regular battle droids I think the Droidicus showed up, but then they just jumped onto the elevator and kind of left them standing there. Yeah, so it, it just was, I mean, like you said, there's tens of thousands of these things on the ship and like six of them show up. So it was a little bit of a letdown, but I mean, we really are just pushing the story because it it, it might have turned in if they went against a huge battle, might have turned into another pod racing thing. So, you know, a part of me wants to see it. There's probably a good reason it's not there. Well, you got to cut it for time, and I understand that some of the conflict was to actually get on the ship, but it just seemed to me like, it, once again, it's a little rushed. Like, you know, we we get there, you know, we know exactly where to go, we know exactly what elevator to take, and then, you know, bam, we're right back to the Chancellor. Good, Ryan George. Double the pride, double the fall. The showdown against Dooku went decidingly different in a different direction this time, but did you feel the battle was a little rushed? What did you think of it visually? And what did you think of Anakin basically beating Dooku on his own after he got kind of whooped the last time out? I, I think it works really well at this point. So, you know, it, it allows us to see, you know, Dooku handled him ease, with ease uh, in episode two. So to have Anakin beat him so handily um, shows how much he how much he's improved and to do it by himself and to do it in a situation where Obi-Wan's incapacitated. I think it was a it, it shows us right away how pow- just how powerful he's gotten. And then to have him execute Dooku, you know, again, shows us, OK, there's there's something wrong here. You know, that's not something you, you don't you know, you don't executed a man who's kneeling you know unarmed and literally uh, yeah unarmed. <laughs> <laughs> literally unarmed <laughs> and, and 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 who's given up so uh i think that that it, you know that scene really you know in one in one scene you know in a few minutes captures a lot of what's going on with with anakin and really makes for a compelling character in a compelling situation uh so i think that up to that point you know as long as he's not speaking we almost get a lot of uh we we can get a lot of kind of pathos uh, just through watching his actions and comparing it to what we we've seen in previous movies so i I think it works really well i don't think it was rushed at all i think it it exactly it works exactly how it needed to for that for that to be conveyed yeah well here in minnesota we have this thing called hockey hair and he definitely had the hockey hair so it's got to be the mullet i think that's what let him beat him well, and that's the thing, right? You know, once you get past Padawan, when you get your night ranking, you, you grow out your hair. He's got his hair, so obviously he passed some trials. He did some things. A little bit of Samson going on there. He's got the locks going, and now he can beat the hell out of him. But, you know, it's not like he made the decision on his own because uh, there's Palpatine kind of working him like a puppet. Yeah, he kind of sticks his hand up the back of him and like, ah, go ahead and kill him. It'll be fine. Yeah, I kind of thought it was like 80s rock band weren't bassist hair, you know. But it, 
that was the thing with this. I mean, Hayden Christensen looked very intimidating when he was scowling and not talking. It all fell apart when he started to try to do dialogue, but he looked the part of a young Anakin that just is tired of this shit. He's tired of this war. He's tired of the conflict. He just wants to put an end to it and, and move on in the next direction in his life, which is probably get him back to Padme, you know, since they've been separated for quite some time. General Grievous, I expected you to be taller. IG, besides having a badass name and very little context within the movie, what did you think of this part machine, part organic general, and the introduction of the Magna Guard, which were also known as Jedi Killers? Well, despite not knowing anything about him, I still thought he was kind of cool. I mean, the the smoker's hack that he had was a little off-putting, but the rest of it, he seemed like a cool guy, especially, you know, he, he had lightsabers hanging in his cape and... He had his badass guards. I kind of liked him. Um, I, I, in that first scene, what was lacking was Grievous doing more because it's like I'm. He just kind of checked out. Like, all right, well, you guys handle this. I'm leaving. I, I wanted more from Grievous. Then we got more from Grievous later, but I wanted it to start then because I wanted there to be a reason to take him more seriously. You know, I, I always like the cowardly villain. I like when they have somebody that all snivel and, and beg for their lives and then come back at a later date and try to really get you, you know, when it's strategically. I didn't think that character needed that. You know, the fact that the, the second things turned against him slightly, he bailed. It's like you, you go through all the character, uh, you go through all the trouble to make this character look like a badass Jedi killer, but he, you know, as soon as the odds go against him, he's going to jump out the window and take an escape pod out. I didn't really think that was necessary. Ryan, what did you think of that? Yeah, I agree. I, agree. I think, I, you know, on the, on, surf, on the surface, he's pretty badass. Like, he's got, he, he's, he's formidable with lightsabers. He's taken a bunch of lightsabers, which implies that he's murdered Jedi. So you would think that he, you know, you compare his introduction to to Darth Maul and he seems a little cowardly kind of like he's like the he's kind of like a cartoon villain the way he's portrayed even though again on the surface he's it seems pretty badass so I wish we would have he would have been a little bit more formidable like you know he could have you know lost a battle to two you know jet uh, you know two pr basically two Jedi masters and still you know come out looking okay but instead he yeah he really just kind of looked like a, ca a cartoon villain so you know it, it, it wasn't a great uh, first impression. He needed a mustache to twirl, and I think it was. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, they were. We... <laughs> you give him a mustache, you got to give him a top hat and a monocle. I mean, you have to. <laughs> the action up to this point has been okay. Even if the dialogue is kind of terrible, it's been okay. Ah, here we go again. We land the ship, everybody thinks okay. Palpatine's rescued, the jet arrow intact. I mean,. God forbid, who knows what happened to the poor people on Coruscant when they, they crashed this freighter into the middle of the planet, but it's another happy landing. And here we go again. Why are you trembling? Something wonderful has happened. I'm pregnant. At least we have the love story to look forward to, right, IG? I mean, were you shocked that our boy Lucas continues his strong run, a romantic dialogue? Is he not the Cal Ripken of love story writing? <laughs> he needs to quit while he's behind. You know, the the one good thing about him selling the Star Wars properties to Disney is thankfully we're getting some people that can actually write the it. He just does not evoke any real emotion. And I don't know, maybe you could explain it away as, you know, they express love differently in the Star Wars galaxy. Cause it's not our galaxy. You know, we actually know how to talk to each other sometimes. I mean, we're a bunch of nerds. Maybe we don't, but we've all got significant others in our life. So maybe we do. Uh, but, you know, I haven't had to say too many of the lines that Anakin has used on my wife to get her to, to partake in any adult extraneous activities. Even though they're winning the war, they continue to give executive powers to Palpatine. And then he decides to install Anakin as a special representative in the Jedi Council. When they don't grant him the title of Master, Skywalker literally loses his shit. Is it starting to look like to you that the majority of Anakin's fault of the dark side was due directly to immaturity? Uh, yeah, it does. And, and again, I think... It's it's still to me a problem more in the writing because there needed a you know, like Lucas needed a way to show that kind of conflict between he and the Jedi. So instead of making it something more subtle and nuanced, it, it's pretty direct. Like and you'd think 
I don't know. I, I, it bugs me a little bit that a lot of it is due to immaturity. When you, you would think that after all the training, no matter how hot headed he is, you know, it, sh- it shouldn't be because he's not patient enough to wait to be a Jedi master. That's kind of silly. I mean, to be a Jedi his whole life. So why does it really matter that much? And so you know, I feel like you're kind of being pulled in all these different directions. Is it because he's immature? Is it because he's in, he loves Padme? Like why? You know, and it should be clear to him that he he's not ready because of the, his actions. So I, but, you know, I think. I just, you know, one of the issues that with the writing is that you know some of it's just it kind of like grievous it's just in your face like you're not it there's no, no nuance to 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 how a lot of this these things are kind of conveyed ig the chancellor doesn't trust the jedi the jedi doesn't trust the chancellor the senate or anakin the only two uh, people in the whole galaxy that seem to trust each other are palpatine and skywalker yet the jedi want anakin uh, Annie to spy on his only friend off the record of course did this plan make any sense to you? No, it certainly didn't. You know, I mean, but maybe it was a test. Maybe that's what they didn't explain well in the movie, that we we know what he's doing, and we're going to see if Anakin will tell us what he's doing. Fact remains, that's not true, because they didn't have any idea that Palpatine was the bad guy. They didn't know, and they just wanted to know what he was plotting, and Anakin being that he loves Palpatine like like a father is the wrong guy to send a spy just the wrong guy uh it was a bad plan bad plan from the Jedi all around and these are supposed to be the smartest most influential and insightful people in the universe and I'm not seeing it (laughs) this was a poor poor decision and to have Obi-Wan deliver it, too, I thought took away from their relationship and made him distrust Obi-Wan, which to this point, he looked like that was probably the only per- the only Jedi that he did trust. I didn't like the way that they did this. I think it probably could have been done a lot cleaner. The dark side of the Force is a path to many abilities that some may consider unnatural. Ryan, Skywalker and the Chancellor sit down for the world's worst Vegas show to discuss the dark side of the Force. Did you see some raw, uh, writing flaws in this? I mean... Palpatine, to this point, is a simple politician, yet he's spitting out the Sith history book, and Skywalker doesn't even bat an eye at it. He's like, dark side, dark side, yada, 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 save Padme, uh, Padme's life. I guess you've, you've got to assume they've got, they've got a close relationship, so some of these things it must have come out before and maybe Anakin is just kind of brushing it off as, Oh, well, he's into his history or he's into, you know, interested in whatever. Uh, you know, so you got to think that they have a close enough relationship that, that, the lines won't bother him so I don't think it's a flaw in the writing and, and regardless I think that it's perf- it's it's performed really well like it's presented really well I love I love you know my, one of my favorite things in the entire um, trilogy is is Palpatine and, and his kind of slow manipulation of Anakin so I'm willing to grant that you know through their relationship they've they've developed a, a certain rapport that he can say something like that and not you know alarm bells don't go ringing for Anakin and also I think he knows at this point you know th- this has been a slow manipulation over you know um, you know over a decade so i think at, at that uh palpatine knows which buttons to push and we even see throughout the movie you know we'll get too much into it but we see that he starts pushing more and prod pushing and prodding more and more to get anakin to react and to get anakin to kind of make some choices so i i didn't see i i really actually liked that scene for the most part palpatine seems to be the only one that's immune to the bad dialogue as well I mean, I don't know if he's a superior actor and that's what does it, but he seems to be the only one that can struggle through and, and actually seem like he knows what's kind of going on and, and the way he delivers his dialogue is near perfect. IG, after knowing Chewbacca for 30 years, we finally get to see his home planet of Kashyyyk. They even snuck him in there, which I thought was good for continuity's sake. The small amount of time we spent on the planet, in my opinion, was amazing. How much better would Return of the Jedi have been if it was set on Kashyyyk rather than Endor? World's better, uh, but... The downfall to that is that the Wookiees are technologically advanced, so I would have a hard time believing that the Empire would be able to build a space station right above their planet and everything else happening, whereas the Ewoks, very little technology. They're still, you know, sticks and stones. Really, it does work to put it on Endor, but it would have been way more badass to be Kashyyyk. Ben finds Grievous, and apparently, Ryan, if you want to sneak up on somebody, what you do is you go and you find the loudest lizard you can to scream (laughs) all the way there, and they'll never see you coming. (laughs) General Grievous' big big reveal is 
not just two, but four arms, which he wields sabers in all of them. Going into the battle, after he starts swinging all four sabers in unison at once, did you like Ben's chances against the asthmatic, ambidextrous robot? Uh, <laughs> I, I did think, I, you know, it's a kind of I had mixed feelings of that that whole scene. I, I liked the four arms, and but it, it almost got like the scene got almost cartoony, you know, like it was it was right on that line, and it almost got too a little too silly and cartoony. But um, you know, again, kind of like we talked about Ian McKellen, um, uh, Ewan McGregor also. You know, he's able to take kind of bad dialogue and bad, uh, just kind of bad, I don't know if it's, uh, I forget, I don't know the word for, you know, positioning and uh, whatever, whatever it is, like, just bad direction and make it work. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So I think that um, he makes that scene work uh, throughout. And so I, I, I thought it, it works well for me, though it is a bit cartoony and silly at at plenty of moments including his entrance on the loud lizard that was a loud lizard nobody <laughs> that's like you just trait all, all, all over <laughs> i remember they they gave them to us in star wars galaxies and i think i wrote it for all 30 seconds of like all right it made that thing. noise constantly <laughs> in the game too it was so bad it's like nope i'll, I'll take my speeder bike back that just goes me mm, thanks i'm good but, uh kenobi getting the best of poor General Grievous once again, he decides to, fl- to flee. He's fleeing the interview. He's out. After a slate chase and a little bit of non-saber hand-to-hand combat, Ben kills Grievous. IG, did you feel like this was the proper use of the good general? I mean, is he like the month of March? Did he come in like a lion and go out like a lamb? He did. Uh, you know, the thing is, I didn't see any further use for him. I mean, so Obi-Wan taking him out is not a stretch to the imagination for me because Obi-Wan kind of always has been important as far as Star Wars is concerned and always been a a powerful character to me. So Obi-Wan seeing the opportunity and looks like he's in trouble. I mean, and he did the same thing in episode one where he's hanging from a thread and uh, I'll make this work. We're fine. And come out on top. That's what, that's what he does. He comes out on top. So Grievous did his part. He did the little bit he needed to do. And then he checked out and the unfortunate part is that he got way more lines and way more action than Boba Fett did. That's all I'm saying. Well, that was the thing about these movies, too, is that we saw Ben Kenobi for a half of one movie. They really, he was kind of cryptic. He didn't really say a lot. So we really didn't have any context of his character. And that was the nice part about these movies was we actually got to know the old man that Luke's, uh, Luke meets further down the line. So I kind of like that as well. I mean, in the book gave the, that fight a little bit of depth. They, in the book, they basically described it as Ben might have been the only person to be able to beat Grievous because he was a master at the basic style of lightsaber play. Like, there's one stance, uh, you know, the basic stance, and he was the absolute best that the Jedi had to offer. So that's why he was able to deal with uh, Grievous' multiple attacks. That's why he was able to kind of disarm him, like you guys said, literally, uh, of at least two of his arms, and get Grievous to uh, kind of run away. Well, and that's the thing, is that that stance that you're talking about in the books, it's the biggest defensive stance. So when you got four lightsabers coming at you, then you get to uh, do like Daffy Duck and... uh, thrust Perry Dodge, right? It worked, and he was able to fight him off and come out on top, which is the standard Obi-Wan thing. I mean, he's done it over and over and over again. I will learn the truth in all this, Ryan. To the surprise of no one playing at home, Palpatine reveals himself as a Sith Lord, and young Anakin is shocked. Ryan, (laughs) what in the entire fuck is going on here? I mean, hey, Ryan, you told me how to uh, get a six-pack, and it worked perfectly. Are you a trainer or something? That was... Obviously not well written, <laughs> or <laughs> uh, yeah, it just didn't make sense. Like you would, you'd think. I mean, a- 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 Anakin had to know on some level, or had to have some clue. And just the way he reacts is so, it just doesn't make sense. And 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 it, the acting is just terrible. So kind of one of the low points of the movie. It just doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and you know, again, I you know, Ian McKellen can can kind of do no wrong because the way that he delivers, the, you know, even the way like. As it's written, makes no sense that he reveals himself that way. But the way he plays it, he does it great. It's just the, the then you get you go from a great classically trained actor, and then you go to you know uh, Hayden Christensen, who then takes someone who who made lemon lemonade out of you know took lemons and turned it into lemonade, and uh, then Anakin or, or Hayden just turns it right back into lemons, and and uh, it's just 
turns back into a bad scene. It really is a good point too, IG, right? It's like you get a pass from the elite passer in all of basketball. Say Magic Johnson throws you a perfect behind the back bounce pass and you go for the three and it goes about two feet and falls on the ground. I mean, <laughs> did it seem like he was a man amongst children in that scene? <laughs> well, that's picking the, the the kid that always gets picked last. That's picking him second instead of so he feels good. And then you like, I'm gonna throw you the ball, and it just smacks him in the face, and he gets a bloody nose. <laughs> what about my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> my glasses are broken. It was it was really poor to. I mean, it, they needed to direct Hayden better. And I know that Hayden has a little bit of a downfall. I mean, even in Jumper, he wasn't great, but he was better in Jumper. So the direction was better there than it was in this but he, they needed someone with a better grasp on what was going on couldn't they have found some good looking kid out of juilliard or something and brought him in to do this stuff i know that they had already attached their cart to this horse by this time but you know it's lucas and that's what happens when you get lucas is sometimes you get a bad decision we can all go watch howard the duck again you see what i mean in this moment coming up he delivers two of the best lines in the whole trilogy. And it's, I am the Senate, and are you threatening me, Master Jedi? Mace and the Jedi pass, he head over to the Sith Lord's quarters to try to force him to give up his executive powers now that the war is over. IG, what did you think of the battle and Palpatine finally showing us his true colors, which were red, by the way? I liked how powerful Palpatine was. That's what I liked about it. So there had been some training somewhere happening in some deep, dark closet somewhere on the planet. He really had such good control. And I understand that it was a lot of really uh, jump cut, close up things because this is not Ian McKellen's strong point. This He's not a physical actor. He's, he's a voice person. He's somebody that has presence, not a physical actor. And he's not a young man either. So you, expecting him to flip and jump around and everything. I know they use some, some stunt doubles and some CGI and stuff, but it did show how powerful... Palpatine was and I liked it I liked it a lot because I mean Mace Windu shows up with what four other Jedi and those other four went down really fast only one that's got any chance against him is basically one of the heads of the council itself which is Mace Windu who's got his own strength in the lightsaber and he's holding his own but he's not making much ground so yeah and Emperor Palpatine is one hell of a bad motherfucker. Ryan, just sticking to the fight, not getting involved in the emotion involved in it, could they have used some stunt doubles there to maybe strengthen the fight a little bit? Uh, which, which portion of the fight? Just the, the Mace Windu uh, Palpatine showdown. I mean, when it came their time, I mean, we got, we got slightly better swords work than we did in the original trilogy, but it wasn't, it didn't represent the two people that were supposed to be fighting all that well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know, I guess so. I think I was I was more focused on the emotions, I guess, and more focused on on what happens kind of in that in the aftermath there to that it didn't bother me so much and you know, almost it's like it, it goes completely the other way cuz initially he's kind of flipping around and then then it kind of takes a step back. So, I don't know, for whatever reason it didn't bug me too much. I don't feel like it you know, we didn't get enough of them in that moment for to say one way or another that it looked bad or, or great. So it didn't bother me too much, uh, to be honest. Well, you brought this up last week, so I'm going to throw this one to you. It was a great switch of position from Sidious using Force Lightning to begging for his life to back to Force Lightning and after killing Mace with Anakin's help. But if it would have went slightly different, do you think Mace could have beat Palpatine in a one-on-one -on -one fight? Or was the Sith Lord just playing possum? Was he kind of holding back his strength for Anakin's sake? And if he would have went full bore at Mace Windu, how do you think it would have turned out? I, I think I think if he goes full bore, he 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 beats Mace Windu. I like I, at least that's what I got out of that scene was that. Uh, oh, you know, what I got out of the scene was that he was playing possum. You know that that he needed Anakin to make that like Anakin needed to make that decision to turn, and so. You know, I think it was it, it works for his character because you really see how powerful it is. I mean, yeah, he takes down four Jedi with no effort, and then, you know, 
it shows right away okay he's he's extremely powerful it would have been cool to see a real knockdown drag out battle between he and mace windu because i think you know we didn't really you know we it would be cool to see, you know would have been cool i think mace i mean um samuel jackson even said that he wanted to go out in a blaze of glory and i don't know that that was really a blaze of glory like it would have been great to see a real battle between the two but i think that he was just playing possum in order to to get anakin to really make that last decision that he needed to make in order to turn i, th- I think ryan hit it right on the head is uh I think Palpatine knew that Anakin's coming back and you got to sit there and you got to keep the fight going till Anakin gets there. And then you have to convince Anakin to help you win, basically severing his last tie to the Jedi, convincing him to make sure he has his full turn to the dark side. And he does it. I mean, and that's why, I mean, a master puppeteer, that's what Palpatine is because he plays him like a fiddle for three movies basically i mean a little bit in the first one not so much but quite a bit in attack of the clones and completely in revenge of the sith and it 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 makes sense because he's just a manipulator he's able to see the weakness and prey on it so yeah he was playing him like a puppet i mean i I think he could have killed windu right when he was killing the other four jedi it wouldn't have been a big deal but he needed him Henceforth, you will be known as Darth Vader. Every single one of the Jedi, including your friend Obi-Wan Kenobi, are now enemies of the Republic. First order of business, wipe out every Jedi in the temple and the random Jedi generals across the conflict. Did the execution of Order 66, Ryan, give you the feels? I mean, as our heroes were slaughtered, was it visually done well? Yeah, I think it was It was visually done well. Uh, it was... I, I, I like the idea. I thought it was great that, you know, obviously, obviously this was a, a setup you know, from way back in Attack of the Clones. So I, I liked the, I liked it visually. I think, you know, Luke, for all the crap we give Lucas for, for dialogue and direction, like he gets, he gets a lot of the, visually there's some very iconic scenes and I think he gets the, the order, the kind of um, execution of Order 66 is done really, really well and definitely gives you the feels. So I think that works really well. I didn't love, you know, again, you know, Anakin, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm I'm torn. I think if we had gotten better direction and acting, I could Anakin's kind of just Anakin's broken at that point, and that becomes a little more that would be a little bit more believable that he's just he's done, he's broken, and he'll do whatever uh, Palpatine says. But it, I'm not sold on that moment because I wasn't sold on him really being a broken man at that point. But uh, yeah, to go back to your question, is yes, I, I think executing Order sixty six looks great. Uh, there's some amazing visuals. Uh, Anakin walking with uh, or Darth Vader at this point with uh, you know thousands of Jedi behind him walking in, you know, out. Was it? It was out of the temple. Um, that's just a beautiful visual. So I think you know he really gets that part. Um, it, no, it almost knocks it out of the park. Visually. IG, Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What should we do? Did we need to slaughter the younglings to cement Lord Vader as evil? No. <clears throat> no, we didn't. We didn't need that much. Um, in in a movie that I really enjoyed, this was probably one of the biggest downfalls is that he had to go in and... And they didn't really show it. They just kind of lightsaber noise and then you kind of assume they're all dead. I, I wasn't a big fan of, of that part. You know, killing children and doing things to children is ju- just shy of, you know, killing someone's dog. So it's really a bad thing in movies when you're doing that. But it does cement a little bit how evil ha- he has become or how evil he's allowed himself to become. Because he, he followed those orders with no question. Um, almost as easily as the clone troopers did with Order 66. And that... That soured me a little bit on that because I would have still thought, I mean, because we even see Darth Vader at certain points question his decisions, you know, like, oh, you know, I don't really want to do this, you know, like even in Empire when he's got Luke on the ropes and he could just end it right there and instead he, he decides that he wants to try and keep him around. So just this early, that easy, and it was not great for that point. There's some other things that were absolutely wonderful with him. That was not one of them. It was a weird character decision, and the fact that, like you said, he did it with no remorse or no thought about it. I mean, even after, uh, you know, the next scene where he goes to deal with the Separatists, you, they see him, they show him crying at least afterwards. I didn't like the way the, the scene played out, and I understand they used it as 
currency to show everybody else, you know, that, that they cared about him as a person that, you know, he's really going bad this time. He's really broke bad. But I, I wasn't a fan of the scene. I think I really thought it was unnecessary. We get it. He's a bad guy. You, you don't need to explain it in, in child terms, I guess, bad use of words, uh, childlike terms for us. Yeah, I, I disagree a little bit. I think I again, I think it works as a I like the idea, you know, if you're writing it, if you're writing out a script or you're writing out an outline, I think it, the idea works. I just think the execution doesn't work because we don't get, again, we don't get the, um, it's, it's not sold earlier on. So we really don't, we, it's because his downfall is kind of hard to buy and, you know, it's hard, you know, it's, there's nothing emotional that comes out of killing the, the younglings. Uh, it it just seems like it, it seems kind of heavy handed and and f- kind of forcing us to 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 see how he's turned, but I think if if it was set up better, I think that it does work and it, it and it's not necessary, but it almost really cements his his turn to the dark side. But we just didn't get the right kind of um, build up to that moment. So I think on paper it's good. And it works, and I don't, I don't want to see kids get killed, but that, but you know, I don't. There are lots of things I don't want to see that sometimes are necessary to move a story forward. But I just think that it, you know, the lead up to it doesn't work, so it makes this kind of seem unnecessary. You saved yourself in that last line because my next line was Ryan is pro killing children. <laughs> <laughs> when my new apprentice Darth Vader arrives, he will take care of you. In the wait till your father gets home moment of the the movie, IG, the Viceroy and the Funky Bunch are taken care of on Mustafar, by the way, worst meeting ever, by the newly formed Sith Lord. Did you feel a slight bit of pity for them? I didn't, and uh, here's why. It's really, they, they were shown as cowards, shown as nobody with a backbone, all the way back to episode one. I was tired of these guys. They They needed to just be done so that's the thing is when you don't care about a character when they get killed it's like eh okay and that nothing made me empathize or feel for these guys at all because they were just too cowardly to stand behind a million droids and try and escape and just back down anytime somebody actually gets within arm shot of you so no i didn't really feel for him uh i did like mustafar though mustafar is pretty cool as the Republic becomes an empire, the new empire wants you all to know that liberty dying to thunderous applause is fake news and you shouldn't pay attention to any of it. <laughs> <laughs> fake news. Ryan, did Obi-Wan obviously violate the bro code by using Padme to get to Anakin? I mean, he blew up his, uh, his spot for all his bad actions, and then when she, he knows that she's going to run to him, he stows, uh, stows away on her ship. Yeah, he, he definitely violated the bro code, but... But it was for the greater good, so I don't I don't blame him for it. Uh, I do wish he he would have uh, you know once they get there he could have kept her out of harm's way. I think when they land on Mustafar he could have you know let her know look I'm here I got to take care of Anakin you got to stay behind. Uh, I so I didn't I think there's definitely he takes some responsibility for what happens because he you know he 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 knows how unhinged Anakin is and and. Uh, yeah, I think, but yeah, he had to he had to save the galaxy, so he did what he had to do, which included violating the bro code. If you're not with me, you're my enemy, and only a Sith deals in absolutes, right? We get an epic showdown between master and former apprentice. What did you think of the lightsaber battle between them? Is that the is that the go to lightsaber battle from any Star Wars movie from this one on? That is this the the one that they're all going to be held up to? Well, this would be the epitome of lightsaber battles. It was amazing, it was thoughtful, it was uh, emotion-invoking. It was really well done. And I mean, and for most of the lightsaber battle, nobody was really gaining any ground, right? It was basically a stalemate through most of the lightsaber battle. And I really loved it because uh, obviously they've got some places where the Jedi can go and learn different styles, learn how to do different things, right? Because... If Master Obi-Wan is good at the first style, but Anakin has learned parts of other styles, then where's he getting it? Because Obi-Wan's not teaching him. It's got to be coming from somewhere. But it, it really did work out well, and, and one of the things that really showed through, and this is one of the parts where Hayden Christensen did very well, 
was the anger that was coming through was very apparent and I did feel it from him. It seemed like, you know, there was rage and anger and Sith coming through. You know, they show green screen of this. You can find it. I believe it might be in some of the, the Blu-rays. And it when they practiced this fight, it was just as fierce as it was on screen. Like, these two really had at each other. And you're right, it was the perfect combination of calm versus anger. Like, you could see the inner peace in Obi-Wan, and you could see the anger in Anakin. And it also was cool because they were kind of canceling each other out at every turn, which... If someone showed you how to do something, they're going to be able to do it just as well, if not better than you. So it really made you feel like these two characters were on the same level, that it was master versus apprentice, but they were doing a real good job of keeping up with each other. Ryan, what did you think of the scene? Yeah, I agree. I think it's the one time where, where Hayden does uh, shine uh, as an actor. He, he does... The, there's real rage there, you know, as Zig said, and you really feel the emotion. I think this is the one part where where I give a lot of credit for the acting all around. I think you really felt that they were two best friends who who had to go to war, and you can see the rage in Anakin, and you can see the that um, Obi Wan is kind of he's resigned to it. He 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 hates it, but he's resigned to the fact that he has to do this. And you can see that and feel that. And I think the battle plays out great. It's you know, it's, it's mostly even. They, you know, it's a little over the top with some of what goes on, but I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a gold standard for, you know, what a lightsaber battle will be from here into the future. It's something I really have to think about. But I think it, that scene does play out really, really, really well. And I give a lot of credit. Again, the, you know, there the acting, everything fits. Like this, the, between the CGI and the choreography and the acting and the setting and the mood, like it all works really, really well for that scene. And I give them a lot of credit for making that work because at the end of the day, um, that's where this entire trilogy is headed is you know these master apprentice best friends and they're going to go to war with each other and so i think i give a lot of credit for 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 that build up at least paying off for this scene well now this this is the gold standard of all lightsaber battles thus far though wouldn't you agree with that uh, yeah you know, i guess what so what lightsaber I mean, I... battle would would trump this one of everything that's as, been out so far as far as spectacle Nothing, but as far you know, I would I would argue that um, Qui Gon and Obi Wan versus Darth Maul had a had, you know was was unique in its own way. Well, yeah, no, I'm saying that was that was great and everything, but I'm saying you know spectacle, emotion, everything, importance, everything that's going on. This really yeah, okay. is kind of this is the gold standard. It doesn't get any better than this. There there was different things going on in the Obi Wan and. Qui Gon versus Darth Maul, and yeah. there were a lot more breaks. This was fast, furious, and moving the whole time. Yeah, from that perspective, then yeah, then I agree with you. You know, if, if you take put everything into account, I don't think it, this is this definitely has the uh, it would be the gold standard at this point. Ig between the music, which was Battle of Heroes, which was amazing by the way, one of my favorite Star Wars songs of all time, and the setting of Mustafar, which was just fire and brimstone. Did this ten minutes of this battle or so kind of save the trilogy for you? Yeah, quite honestly, yes, it did. Because, I mean, everything building up to this, we knew this is where it was going, but it still helped get us there, right? Everything that happened and seeing why this is so important, yeah, it really did save it. I mean, because you can see the the slow trickle down into Darth Vader that Anakin had because he was a bright-eyed little boy and then he was kind of a little bit messed up teenager and then really conflicted as a young adult. So you you got to see a gradual downfall rather than, you know, sitting up at a high level, running across and then all of a sudden falling right off of a cliff and now I'm Darth Vader. So as bad as some of the acting and dialogue and everything else was, this this pulled it all right back to where I'll watch it again. I'll watch all of it again because it all pushes me to this 10 minutes. Back on Coruscant, Palpatine throws the whole Senate at Yoda. Literally, the whole Senate. But Ryan, you being an undercover wrestling fan, in pro wrestling terms, did it surprise you to see the heel get a clean win? What did you think about Sidious's victory? <laughs> That's a great analogy. Uh, yeah, I was disappointed. Like, we... we okay... You know, in a way, it's, it's done well, because we saw... We see Sidious decimate 
an, you know, five Jedi with with no problem. And the one guy, the one Jedi that gives him a problem, it, it's pretty apparent that he he just allows him because he needs to buy some time. So I think we we're giving Palpatine his. You know, he's got he's got to be. Or you know, I mean, Sidious is obviously powerful, but yeah, Yoda's Yoda's the the hero, and and he's the baby face, and he should, and he's the you know he's the greatest Jedi alive. So. I wish that it would have. I wish it would have been a little more even. I wish that we would have seen, you know, Palpatine resor- have to resort to some other tactics to win. Because yeah, it was. It was kind of. It was a letdown. Because yeah, it was really. You're right. It was a clean win. I can't. Like that's one of the best analogies I've heard for like anything relating to Star Wars. Like it really was. Like the heel just got a got a clean victory. It's over, Anakin. I had the high ground. No, you overestimate my ability to deliver meaningful dialogue. Some people just don't listen, Ig. And he's cut down by his mentor, losing both his legs and one of his arms. And if that's not a bad enough day, he slides into lava. The shell of Skywalker, burnt and beaten, is taken back to Coruscant and fitted with the iconic black battle armor and apparently James Earl Jones' voice to keep him alive. Do you feel that they captured the birth of Darth Vader properly? And what did you think about the moment that the helmet lowered down to the newly minted Dark Lord of the Sith? I really do think it worked. Um, And... Manipulating the midi chlorians to give life and everything, I think that might have been a little bit of what Sidious was doing, bringing them back. And you know, they they weren't trying to treat any burn wounds or anything. They were just like, let's slap some new uh, robotic hardware on this guy and build a suit around it. You know, and the robot chicken did a really good part on this, where it was great. He's like, yeah, black leather, that'd be wizard. <laughs> so <laughs> I've laughed more about it since then, but. When they were lowering the helmet on, that really did give me the feels at that moment watching it. I can remember back even to the first time watching it, I was like so amped up, marking out, because I was like, wow, here it is. Darth Vader is kicking. We've got him. Yeah, despite a little bit of shaky dialogue once they had the suit on him, I don't think that could have been handled any differently or any better. It was him being put together as part human, part machine, and uh, that seeing the, the first person's pr- perspective as the helmet was lowered down onto his face and the mask was put on and the breathing starts, I thought that was one of the most perfect moments in the whole trilogy. What did you think, Ryan? Yeah, I agree. I think le- that works really well. I think it was great to see his demise, which was basically down, comes down to his own hubris, like that we had a situation where, uh, you know, they're evenly matched the whole time and Obi-Wan gets a small advantage and Anakin... And Anakin, you know, because of hubris and his own rage and immaturity, does something rash and and short sighted and loses bat, you know, severely because of it. And then it shows that Palp- that Sidious and and Anakin had have have a really they're connected, and Sidious knows and he's able to you know rescue him. And I think yeah, that scene plays out perfectly uh for it's like frankenstein's monster and definitely gives you the feels when the mask finally gets on and that you know the sound of like i don't know if it's like the air um lock or whatever like everything in that scene works well until well are we up to the point where he uh, yeah, yells we're not no? even going to cover that because it's so nonsensical we're, like i said some clumsy written dialogues okay. Yeah, well, so that's that's the thing. Is it's I remember thinking that the whole time. I'm get I got I had the feels. I'm excited. It was such a great scene. And when he yells no, I started laughing hysterically in the theater. And it was like, it just killed it. <laughs> you did all that setup. It was so beautiful. And then he yells no, and it was just like that kills it for me. But leading up to it, like the, he just gets every beat so so right in that up until it's that. It's just point. a carefully crafted reminder from Lucas on how to not write dialogue. <laughs> Yeah. No! <laughs> Skywalker must translate into self-fulfilling prophecy in Jawa. As Padme does in fact die in childbirth, the twins, Luke and Leia, are born and separated and hidden from the Empire. We get a closing collage of them being delivered to their new homes in Alderaan and Tatooine. And Vader overlooking the construction of the Death Star, which, by the way, must be union labor because it took a long time to get that first one built setting all the pieces together for the yet unthought of Rogue One in the classic episode for A New Hope. Ryan, your thoughts on the end montage, the movie, and your rating? I think I, I really like the end montage. I love the music. Um, I mean, I love the music throughout. I think obviously the score for all of these movies are just fantastic, and I really love the score for, for um, Revenge of the Sith. 
uh, you know, it, it had the perfect blend of kind of fan service, but hope, I guess, uh, at the at that ending montage. So I really, I really, really like it. Uh, as a movie, you know, we 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 harp on the uh, dialogue and the direction because they were not good for much of the movie, but. I, I think that Revenge of the Sith is by far the best of the uh, prequel trilogy. I re I you know in spite of its problems, I really really enjoyed it. I think that uh, there was enough fan service and enough emotion you know built into it that I really really you know really I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it when I watched it outside of a few spots here and there. And on subsequent viewings, it's definitely the most my most watched of the prequel trilogy. And I always enjoy watching it. You know, again, it has its problems, but I, you know, I'll look past it because I do like what it gets right. Uh, and I would give it a, a 7.5 or 8. So I would say, you know, again, you know, was, I'm going to look past some of the clunky dialogue and direction, but say that I really, what, what it gets right, I really, really like. And so I'll give it you know, 7.5, 8, depending on my mood. I'm not going to lie. This is the Star Wars trilogy movie I've probably watched the most. I think a lot of it is due to the point where it came out in my life and how there was a lot of important things going on. So it reminds me back to that time when things really started to come together for me as an adult. The movie is just riddled with some of the worst dialogue written in any movie. And some of it is just pure nonsense. However, my love for Star Wars allows me to suffer through it for some of these key moments. I thought this movie saved the trilogy as a whole. I loved, loved the epic battle between Skywalker and Kenobi. The rise of the Sith, the fall of the Jedi, even though it felt a little rushed to me, Order 66 could have been a movie in its own. I mean, I always treat these movies like your family. You gotta love them for who they are and not who you want them to be. I am it proudly. My name is Joe, and I'm a Star Wars addict, and I've been that way since I was five years old. And Jar Jar Binks and Lucas's piss-poor dialogue couldn't take that away from me, no matter how much they tried over the last three movies. I give Revenge of the Sith a nine, not because of how strong the movie was, but because it finally answered some of the questions on screen that I've had since I was a little boy playing with action figures. Yeah, and I'm going to give the movie an 8 for much of the same reasons. Uh, you know, explaining a lot of the mythos. Now, I don't know about all the rest of you, but midichlorians to me, that's gone. I just erased that from my memory. We're not even going to talk about that because I hate that thing. I like the way Yoda explained the Force in Empire Strikes Back. That is just a force that binds us and... It's everywhere in that rock, in that tree. That's where I am with the Force. But everything else is great. And I love this movie because of the same reasons that Cynic was saying. Is that I was, this is my first time as an adult that I was really in a decent place in my life. That I could just go and enjoy this for what it was and let it bring the youth back out in me. Because just like I was a little boy back in 1977 when the original came out playing with my action figures, having a great time, going to the drive-in with my parents and watching the original trilogy. This is Star Wars at its purest form. And that battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin will forever be just the greatest thing I've ever seen. I really love this movie, and I know I'm not giving it a 10, but there are better Star Wars movies out there. So I can't give this a 10 when there's already better stuff out there and even the more recent stuff is better than this both the force awakens and rogue one so i've got big hopes for episode eight coming later this year we'll be talking about it when we get to that therefore there you go cynic radio podcast revenge of the sith episode three of star wars we're going to give it an 8.5 we really enjoyed this movie you should go watch it again and if you haven't seen it what are you waiting for Get on the Star Wars train. There's nothing better. And that's it for episode 49 of the Cynic Radio Podcast. We loved covering the Star Wars prequels for you. We'll be back soon with more Star Wars coverage, more Walking Dead, and more of everything you love. I'm your host, Igrahi. With me has been my co-host, Cynic. Ryan George is here with us. You can find him over at thegymwits.com. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Send us your comments, questions, and concerns to cynicradio at gmail.com. Find us on the internet at cynicradio.com. Look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cynicradio. And follow us on Twitter at cynicradio. Head on over to tpublic.com. Get your own Cynic Radio podcast gear. T-shirts, cups, mugs, posters, whatever you want, they've got it. We can't wait to be back here again next week with more stuff for you. 
We love bringing it to you. We love that you listen, and we love every single one of you. Keep coming back. Share it with all your friends. Like, listen, subscribe. And until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at CynicRadio.com. Available for download on iTunes. hard word to say, random Jedi generals.